great. Welcome, everybody. Um, it is lovely to see so many people and so many um, people that I know and so many people that I don't know. Um, I think this is going to be a wonderful evening and I'm really happy that we are able to do this. Um, we are hosted tonight by the Birmingham and Midland Institute and, um, and this, is, this event is being recorded and will be available on their YouTube channel afterwards. But the event um, is part of the BCU Exchange Festival um, celebrating International Women's Day. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Serena Trowbridge and I'm a reader in Victorian literature um, in the School of English at BCU. Um, so I normally deal with Victorian women poets, but um, it is my pleasure as much as possible to deal with contemporary women poets as well. Um, so if you haven't already, can I ask that you mute yourself, please, um, just to make sure that we can um, hear everybody as clearly as possible. Um, and um, so we have um, five poets reading to us this evening. And after that, we will be having a bit of a discussion about women's poetry. Um, and I will be very interested to hear the views, not only of the panel, but also of those of you um, who are here in the audience. So it is my very great pleasure then to introduce as um, our first poet, um, Jacqueline Safra, um, who will be familiar to many of you, um, but I will introduce her fully anyway. She is a poet, editor, agitator, teacher, organiser and word enthusiast, although she says not necessarily in that order. She's increasingly interested in genre bending. Um, so there are poems, prose poems and proems in her most recent collection. And uh, I will shortly post a link to her most recent collection, um, the 100 Lockdown Sonnets, um, which is now available in paperback um, into the chat bar shortly. She is an enthusiastic collaborator and works with composers, musicians and visual artists. She was a founder of The Shuffle, a regular live poetry night, poet in residence for Good Housekeeping and a board member for Magma Poetry. Uh, she offers mentoring and she teaches poetry in all kinds of settings, including the poetry school. Jacqueline has won a few prizes, she says, and um, her work has been widely anthologized. Um, her pamphlets, I have to say, she has brilliant titles for her books, in my view, um, uh, her, uh, include uh, Rock and Roll Mama, uh, which was published by Flair Stack in 2008, The Kitchen of Lovely Contractions from Flipped Eye in 2011, which was nominated for the Oldborough uh, First Collection Prize. Uh, a book of prose poems, If I Lay on My Back, I Saw Nothing But Naked Women, which was in illustrated by Mark Andrew Webber, was published in 2014 with Emma Press. Um, and there was also a specially composed series of musical miniatures for cello and piano by Benjamin Tassie that accompanied the poems in performance. And that won the best collaborative work in the Saboteur Awards of 2015. Uh, the T.S. Eliot Prize shortlisted collection is All My Mad Mothers, uh, published by Nine Arches in 2017. Um, a Bargain with the Light, Poems After Lee Miller, was published by Hercules Editions, and her collection Dad, Remember You Are Dead was published by Nine Arches in 2019, uh, followed by a chap chapbook, uh, Veritas, Poems After Artemisia, by Hercules Editions in 2020. And as I said, her latest book is 100 Lockdown Sonnets, um, and that was published in February 2021. And I will post a link to that shortly, but in the meantime, I will hand you over to Jacqueline. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all right now. Um, someone, uh, I think it was Helen Ivory, just posted an, a necklace that she had bought that said, you're on mute. Um, and I've bought two because I think, you know, they're probably quite useful. So, um, yeah, thank you. That took a long time to read, didn't it? <laughs> seemed a very long list, but I suppose I've been going for a while. And, and just recently, there seemed to have been quite a few books, kind of one on top of the other. Um, but I, I don't know when the next one will come out. Um, yes, so the most recent one is 100 Lockdown um, Sonnets, and uh, well, there it is, product placement. Um, uh, so uh, this is a timely time to be um, talking about women. Some awful things have been going on, which I won't even discuss because we all know what they are, but, but um, it's a good time to be together and be in solidarity, I think. And um, so I've got a sort of mixture of poems from a couple of collections of mine that I think address some of the things to do with with women in this world, both positive and negative. So um, I'm going to start off with this, this sonnet called The Canon, which is um, from 
the collection Dad, Remember You Are Dead, this one, uh, which is, you know, uh, quite an angry uh, collection, I would say. And um, it's it started off being about trying to come to terms with my father and his death. Um, and so in a way, it's a book about haunting, but it's not just about being haunted by a father. I guess it's about being haunted by all those men who, who came before and exist now. Um, and as a poet, I think this is a um, one that's particularly close to my heart, this poem, The Canon. So I'm actually, um, because of, for access reasons, in case there's anyone who's deaf who's listening, um, I, I've started trying to share my, um, my poems, uh, share screen. Yeah, so you should be able to see them as I'm reading them. So this is The Canon. The men are in my room again. This time I wake with Petrarch panting in my ear while the bards at my desk checking my rhymes. Such joy. I kiss the poet's inky fingers, share my love, thanking them for form and beauty. But we don't like your lady stuff, your loose ways with art and man, they say, your take on history. Milton reminds me of my fall from grace. Wyatt tries to bridle me and Spencer sits too close. The men push me towards the dark, but I'm too fast. You'll never stop my mouth, not now I've started. I can play rough too. I'll write my world, I'll take my place. I spit this shape onto the page. I make my mark. Uh, and I partly wrote that sonnet because there is a sort of feminist view that um, women shouldn't be writing in these forms that were created by men. Um, and I, I vehemently disagree with that point of view because I think that we can make these forms our own. We can, we can, we can own them and we can use them to say what we want to say. I'm, that's obvious, isn't it, from the poem? Um, so uh, this one, I don't know if any of you have been to the planetarium or if you can remember being in the planetarium, but um, I've always found that I haven't really been able to see the patterns that are described until they actually draw the lines around them. So um, that was where this poem began, but it is certainly not where it ended. The big picture. But I can't see the shape of the swan at all not even when they join up the dots, not even from these plush planetarium seats that tilt into the infinite amid a rush of stars and rising music to catch the awesome scale of the universe against our very smallness. But just when I'm starting to unsee the images I came here to forget, here is Cygnus, a constellation christened, some say, after serial rapist Jupiter, immortalised by poets, who took form as a swan and forced himself on leader. There is nothing old and nothing new about man's cruelty, which, once glimpsed, is branded forever on the retina, infinite as the cosmos. Women as spoils of war, Rape as revenge, yes, I would kill to save my daughters and prostrate now in the dark, my eyes in riot mode, I can't see anything, but this, that scene I came here to forget. A roar of men, a blur of arms, stones aimed towards the head of one violated woman buried up to her neck in dirt. Remember the telescope we once bought on a whim so we could read the stars? The couple that we glimpsed by accident through a lighted window opposite. Flicker of fist and fall, our scramble for the phone, the coming of the slow police, the ambulance. How we left the telescope enduring in the corner with its broken hinge, its blinkered eye, and never spoke of it again. Is it possible to see too much? Um, I think it sort of is possible to see too much. I think we're exposed to so many of these awful images and, and ideas that, um, yeah, you know, at the moment, I personally am finding it quite overwhelming. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to move you on now to a bit of defiance. Um, my mother um, 
was present in North London in the 1960s. Um, she had met Sylvia Plath. She was hanging around with a lot of poets and writers. And um, her lodger ended up marrying the critic um, Al Alvarez. And um, he was not very keen on my mother, it became apparent, when I read a, a memoir of his a while ago. Um, and in fact, mentioned her a couple of times in, in, in a not very nice way. Um, so I took a couple of quotes from that memoir, which I will share with you. So my mother was called Mana. He said, Mana was small and combative and troublesome. And he said, Mana's mother, that's my grandmother, could outnag anyone. Um, so I'm thinking about the different generations of my women, of women in my family, these feisty women. Um, but just notice those words, small, combative, troublesome, nag, all those words that women are quite often insulted with. So I've got two daughters. My mother's will. Who would dare to silence my small daughters bred to trade in molten noise? They throw their heads back, roar until they torch the ceiling of the world. Oh, the splendid heat of them, trailing our fire thread of love and trouble. Even my combative mother and her mother and her mother drag their spirit bodies up from long death to applaud. Because the thing is that, you know, my mother was a single parent. She made a living all her life. She was a, a difficult woman, but she was a fantastic woman. My grandmother was a, a member of the Communist Party. You know, she was a real force. She left school at 13. She was self-educated. And the only thing that this man could say about her was that she could out-nag anyone. So, um, yeah, I was quite angry about that. So, um, so kind of changing centuries, because the, the thing about this type of oppression is that it, it, it straddles millennia, right? It's not, it's not new. It's never been new. And, and cultures, different cultures, uh, before and now. And um, so this book, the um, Veritas, the poems after Artemisia, um, explores the life and work of Artemisia Gentileschi, a Renaissance painter, a woman who was famous because infamous because she was the subject of a rape trial, um, who was raped at 17 by one of her teachers. And because she was disgraced um, and ruined, um, she ended up being able to do uh, what she would not have otherwise been able to do, which was um, spend her life painting. And uh, that's cutting a very long story short. Um, she often painted mythological paintings, um, as much of her many of her contemporaries did, but she had a different. She put a different slant on them, I'd say. Um, and uh, one of her most famous paintings is Judith and Holofernes, the very bloodthirsty painting where she's um, sawing um, his head off uh, with the help of her maid Abra. Uh, but I'm not going to read you the sonnet about that. I'm going to read you the sonnet about Judith and her maid servant. Um, I actually should have had a picture to share, um, but, but you can probably see this painting here. Um, and I think you can see um, Judith is the one you, whose face you can see, and the woman next to her is her maid Abra. And I think this is a really good example of a woman interpreting a story where um, there's some solidarity um, very clearly visible between two women. Um, and this is not generally how Male, uh, male painters would have painted that scene or did paint that scene. So, are you all with me? Can't see any of you, so I don't know. Yeah, a few thumbs up would be good, just so I know you're still there. Good, great. Um, so, um, this is Judith and her maidservant. So they've just chopped his head off, they've got his head in a basket. How are they gonna get out of the enemy camp with this, with this head? Uh, so this is 1613, she, she painted this painting. From her ancient world, she seems to rise and say, look at this harmless severed head, gray fruit in a basket, feast for flies with added colors, drizzled rills of red. Judith and Abra pause in unison, hold each other, leaning towards the dark. Listen. What lies beyond? Here's one man down, but only one. 
The women lurk and spark all fired up. Drunk on the stink of blood, they linger in the light of this reversal before they turn to face a useless god. Perhaps they've got away with it, but still they look for mercy. As the bad blood dries, they offer up their truth, immortalised. So, um, my mother was famously photographed at the, um, and had her picture in the Morning Star at the front of a demonstration, 1971-1972, a demonstration about a law that they were trying to change the abortion laws to make it more difficult to get an abortion. And uh, there was my mother with all the doctors in their white coats at the front of this demonstration. So, this is called uh, Getting Into Trouble. Mr Giles said he didn't want the school used as a political jousting ground and made me take the pro-abortion poster down. Although I explained patiently that the ancient Romans didn't mind it, that the church was okay with it in the 13th century until quickening when, they said, the soul enters the body and the statute books condoned it. Michelle, who was a born again, insisted life was ensouled even before conception. Claire believed that once the fetus was viable, it had a right to exist. My mother said she didn't believe in the primacy of the unborn, and I sat in biology wondering if I had a soul, and if I did, where it was. I daydreamed of knitting needles, coat hangers, and permanganate. After my mother came home from hospital, unharmed, grateful and political, only to find that my stepfather had spent her emergency money on canvases and Carlsberg and dinner with that woman in Portobello Road, she sent me straight to the doctor to get myself a Dutch cap. My boyfriend, who was stupid but useful, told all his friends I was a virgin and forced me to see close encounters of the third kind three times and listen to nothing but Genesis, which I preferred to the Sex Pistols because I never believed there was no future. Not when my mother was, at least for now, empty wombed and full of soul as she stirred a pot of her famous lentil soup not yet tied by blood to the man she loved. We have to fight to keep those rights. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, reach for this book now, which is the 100 Lockdown Sonnets, um, just available in paperback if you want to buy it. Um, so I did write 100 sonnets over lockdown. Um, I wrote one a day. Of course, I did quite a lot of revising of those sonnets um, afterwards. Um, but the core of, the, you know, the core of each sonnet was there by the time I got to the revision process. And um, the, the books are kind of um, poetic diary of those times. Sometimes the poems are quite personal. Sometimes they're um, explicitly political. A lot of the time they are angry. Um, and this one um, has a, an epigraph from Pretty Patel. Um, this is from the 13th of April and look uh, last year and look where we are now. We're kind of back there, aren't we? So um, you can probably hear from the tone in my voice that I'm um, still enraged. So this is Sonnet 22, 13th of April 2020. Home Secretary Pretty Patel insists there is support available for at-risk women as charities report massive increase in calls. And back to rage again. Distilled, confined, it finds new entrances. Somewhere a woman shakes between four walls. Her days unwind like rope, love's noose, as daily bulletins parade their numbers, not her numbers. Twisted, Silent, somewhere in a hot house room, a man is letting go, finding his fists. The social offers, hashtag you are not alone. The cops are out on call, sirens streak the night with platitudes. 
Be safe. Go home. Stay home. But home is gormless, earless, voiceless, blind. It lets the blood rush in. It lets the curse run on and beyond mercy. Behind some frozen door, a man parades his shame. Another woman falls. I have this hideous fear of crying at my own poems during a reading. So I, <laughs> I try to read them loads of times so that doesn't happen. Because obviously there are quite a lot of tears when I'm writing them sometimes. So um, they're still in there. Um, so I thought I'd sort of um, move on to a different register with this one, which I have not really read um, out loud before. It's also, um, it's in um, All My Mad Mothers. And uh, I guess it's because I've been thinking about the line. I've been thinking the, about the line between what is acceptable and was, what isn't acceptable from men. Um, and sometimes it's clearer than other times. Small blue hotel. Maybe because he promised me a small blue hotel known to my golden friends, Becky and Ivor, who brought us together or because he kissed me the French way on the gangplank and held up the cue with ne me quitte pas, sung slightly of key, and could smoke a pack of twenty Gaulois one after the other in homage to his French ancestors. Or because he adored Apollinaire and Les On Mille Verges, collected back issues of Playboy not for the centrefold, he said but for the bunny girls with their little, little cotton tails. Maybe because he called me méchante and mignonne and read me Flaubert's love letters to Louise Collet while his free hand played underneath my shirt as he declared his life was sexless before me, till me he'd always felt like a stranger and had I seen the man who fell to earth while well, he was David Bowie and I was Candy Clark. Or maybe because he said he longed to paint me before, after and during, but wasn't it sad that Becky and Ivor had never consummated their marriage even at the small blue hotel with its billowing curtains of white and its lavender air, not like he and I who would consummate all night and all day until there was some crisis at home with his kids or the electrics. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so um, I think I might just finish here. So this is the, this is a, a poem about um, sitting in a restaurant with a friend. Um, I think there are not enough poems about women and women's solidarity. So um, this is for my friend Anya, um, another poet, and it's called there are not many friends I can talk to like this over a continental breakfast. For Anya. I, I wrote this before my father died, by the way. But I finished it after he'd gone. We should write about other things, not just death, you say. But what about Rufus, who threw himself off a bridge, jewels with incurable cancer, Charlie under a car? Then again, I fear my father may last another 20 years. You console me with five maximum. A fall followed by pneumonia will get him like most of us. Why not a heart attack, I ask? You are sceptical. Suggest his latest wife could bump him off. That will be good, I say. She deserves a prison sentence. Your own father, you vouch might choose to die slowly and need hospitalisation or a care home and you'll be left with all the paperwork. It occurs to me that one day, over a continental breakfast, my children will talk about me like this. You say that is highly unlikely and because you are the most honest person I know, I let myself believe you. I notice the porridge you ordered two hours ago has not yet arrived and you have eaten both my croissants. My dear friend, one day someone will ask us to contribute to that death anthology we talked about. Isn't life wonderful? 
Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was marvellous. And there are many things there that I want to return to, I think. And um, perhaps we will do later when we have a, a discussion. Right. Um, so moving on to our next speaker, and this is Claire Walker. And Claire's poetry has been published in journals and magazines, including Poetry Birmingham Literary Journal, The Interpreter's House, Prole, Marble and Ink, Sweat and Tears and in anthologies such as The Pocket Poetry Book of Love by Paper Swans Press. She has had two <clears throat> poems shortlisted in the 2019 Welsh Pool Poetry Festival competition, and her most recent solo publication is Collision Against the Grain Poetry Press in 2019. Her pamphlet, Somewhere Between Rose and Black, B Press in 2017, was shortlisted for the best poetry pamphlet in the 2018 Saboteur Awards. In August 2020, V Press published Hierarchy of Needs, a retelling, a co-authored pamphlet with Charlie Barnes. Claire is co-editor of Atrium Poetry Webzine, and it is a great pleasure to be able to hand you over to her now. Thanks, Serena, and thank you ever so much for inviting me to read at this event tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was thinking about what poems to read tonight, and I've decided to split my reading into two parts to focus on two particular women. And the first of those women is someone who's personal to me. So I'm gonna start by reading a few poems from Somewhere Between Rose and Black, which was inspired by a diary that my great aunt Molly kept in the 1960s, when she and her husband were renovating a sort of really run down cottage in Bewdley, which is a small town in Worcestershire. And the diary is sort of a mainly factual account of the renovations that they've been doing. Um, but I, I never knew my Aunt Molly, she died before I was born, but I kind of feel like I got to know her a little bit by reading her diary. Um, and that was sort of quite important to me. And in a wider sense, and sort of in the, the, the context of this evening, I love being able to use kind of sources or secondary sources from women to sort of tell their story. I love to see that kind of evidence used by people to keep women's stories out there. So I'm gonna start with a few poems from that pamphlet. This first one is called Moving. Sky hangs a different way. Light slants, flashes as the van rolls along dirt tracks to the door a key in the broken lock. His hand finds mine, our fingers not as we cross the threshold. While we stack boxes on bare boards, that sky is everywhere. It peers into windows, down through a shredded roof. The clouds drift on and on, make judgments as they pass. Our shell of sticks blown down by night creatures, waiting for us to puzzle walls back together. I stand in the doorway, watch the sun arch swollen frames. It binds all things. Skeleton house, this sky will know if I fail to build a home. And the next poem is called Building Materials. If I lie on the kitchen floor, my back shrinking from cold quarry stone, I can see the night's purple sky. The roof isn't yet fixed. He tries, works hard against the weather, but this is only one of many jobs. His arms that used to reach for me are always full of bricks, his mouth full of clay. I watch the moon through fallen tiles, Tomorrow, we must steady them against the threat of rain. And as I said in my introduction to this, most of the diary was a purely factual account of things that they, they were doing either to the garden or to the cottage itself. But there are a few instances where she kind of slips and lets, um, lets it be known that she's not particularly happy in this cottage. Uh, my mom tells me that she was a very social person, but the cottage was very rural, very isolated. And I think she was just very lonely there. Um, and there's this one particular entry that really got me where in amongst the kind of factual account 
of the day, she sort of slips in this line where she says that she has a good marriage, but there's no laughter in it. And that just struck me as a really sad thing to kind of admit, you know, if just to yourself in your own personal diary. And it inspired this, this particular poem that I'm going to read now, which is called Marriage. I slip between journal pages. Words are no longer purely fact. I see the metaphor in storm talk, my repetitions of fallen nests, failing plants, trying to decide if earth is working for or against me. He is a good man, but I am cold in this half-built home, its damp, heartless hearth. I want the lightning cracks that laughter ignites between bodies, the lit fire eyes of compatible minds. What is the point of reconstruction? These walls remain uneven, drafts still shudder past the door. I leave my walking boots facing the forest, wonder if he can read meaning. But thankfully things do improve and the diary sort of ends on a more hopeful note and so the pamphlet reflects that. So I'm going to finish this section of my reading by um, reading out one of those slightly more hopeful poems. This is called Apple Picking. Finally, something works. The tree heaves beneath the weight, that first flood of fruit. We pick, store, rejoice. Windfall offers enough to deer, the branches remain full for us. Green, blushing red in my hands, life dressed in September colours. Too sharp to eat raw, they soften at golden sugar, simmered flames. Flour and butter crumble through my fingers, ready to blanket the sweetness. Much is stored away, jars, bottles, anything that holds. Whole ones nestled together, stalks entwined in the pantry's sleeping dark. We cannot contain it all. Hot inside our thawing mouths, we smile for each other, for the turning of earth. We eat the evening spoon by spoon. So for the second part of my reading, I'm going to um, read a few poems about a woman called Mary Anning, whom lots of you have probably heard of. Um, she was a fossil hunter and paleontologist in Lyme Regis in the 1800s. Um, she's credited as one of the um, most important figures in um, furthering our knowledge of science and the earth. And she hasn't always received the credit that she should have because of the times that she was living and working in. And thankfully, that's changing a lot now. Um, but she's a yeah, she's a fascinating character and, and her story sort of really grabbed me. I first heard of her when my daughters were studying her at school. So I'm, I'm glad that she's on the curriculum and people are finding out about her story. Uh, and the first poem that I'm going to read about her is um, sort of comes from the fact that a popular tongue twister is said to be written about Mary Anning. She sells seashells. Say it quickly. Wrap your tongue around that line. The snaking twist of S, the soothing shh. Now picture the girl. I gather the coast. Hidden art waits for my fingers to unfold rocks. I line my finds out on a table, little fancies I've cleaned to show the shape of all our pasts. Day trip ladies' brows, hand easy pennies over for trinkets that feed me, feed my brother. Limestone presses messages on the seashore, falling tides wash gasps of survival. And this next poem is about one of her most famous finds, which was the ichthyosaur. And it was the first uh, ichthyosaur skeleton to be identified. This is called Explaining Dinosaurs. It is no easy task, coaxing evolution. The thought quarries in my mind of churches eroding like cliffs at my hands. Most would laugh me off the edge, claim a hoax. But here is the ichthyosaur, its pointed jaw jettying out from the flowered disc of eye socket, 
still wearing an almost grin. The mouth has long since closed its teeth, but cannot untell possibilities. This creature used to breathe. It walked upon our earth with warm blood. And my final poem um, is called At the Museum. And this is about the fact that for a long time, as, I, as I've said, um, her work wasn't properly credited because she was working in the 1800s and she was, of course, a woman. So um, she wasn't allowed to join sort of the Royal Geological Society and sort of any of those kind of men only clubs at the time. Um, and thankfully that is changing a lot now and there's um, been quite a lot written about her in recent years. There's a film coming out about her life. Um, and uh, the, the thing that I like most, I think, is that uh, a girl who lives in Lyme Regis, her name's Evie, and she's 12 years old, I believe, um, sort of started a campaign to get a statue erected of Mary Anning in Lyme Regis, because she was sort of, she got all fired up and was annoyed about the fact that this famous woman from their town wasn't represented in any way. And it's, I just love that, that she kind of felt moved to start this campaign and loads of people have backed it and they've raised the money for this statue which I think is going to be unveiled later this year or next year, possibly. Um, but yes, sadly, it wasn't always this way. And this poem reflects that. At the museum. In glass cases, bigger than my childhood home, they display the rocks of my life's work. Together, men call like gulls over scraps, applaud their knowledge and its evolutionary weight. They will not, yet, accept these finds as a woman's, will not acknowledge my days searching the tide, days when the sky could do anything, layers of grey and blue stacked against each other. How easily we set ourselves this way, man over woman. They call me handmaid, think I gather pretty shells in my bonnet for no reason but a pleasing shape. They are wrong to try and erase me, an expert at preserving remains. The swirls of my fingerprints are spelled out on flint, letters chiselled in the lines of my nameless bones. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, yes, it, it is a shame we can't do proper applause, but um, I can see that um, Jacqueline is silently applauding and, um, and that we have lots of um, applause emoticons appearing as well. So our, our next speaker tonight is Nosh Saba, and uh, Nosh was for many years an IT lecturer and community organiser, and she recently um, completed an MA in creative writing, um, for which she uh, achieved a distinction, and she now works as a freelance writer and editor. Her short play, Coins, was staged at the Rep and longlisted for the pint-sized play competition in 2019. Her double micro pamphlet box set, which is a very beautiful thing entitled Heredity Astronomy, uh, was published by Legitimate Snack last year and she is a trustee at Poetry London and co-founder and editor at the marvellous Polina Press. So um, it's a great pleasure now to hand you over to Nosh. Thank you so much, Serena, um, and thank you, Jacqueline and Claire. And I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the readings as well. There's already been so much to, to just take in and think about um, having listened to you both speak. And I was reminded also of, of Jacqueline's um, launch event that you did for the sonnets. Um, and you spoke a lot about um, community and, and friendship there, and it was, it was an event that you know really felt like that was the core of um, what was happening, and your beautiful introductions really stood out to me as well because they really centered that you know um, collaborative sort of relationship um, in growing as poets and learning and and developing your craft. And I really appreciated listening to that, and and I was reminded of that tonight. Um, and that's probably informed some of my um, choices for what to read as well. Um, one thing that we tend to do um, for our uh, poetry night that we used to run before COVID happened um, in the centre of Birmingham in Digbeth um, is that we always start readings with someone else's work and that's something that I really like doing actually. So I'm going to read um, from Sally Purcell um, and I felt that 
the poem that I'm going to read just really spoke to the moment and the things that have been going on um, the last few weeks. So I'm going to try to share my screen so you can see an image of it. I wasn't um, prepared enough to have it all in one Word document. So there might be a bit of sharing and unsharing to get the right um, poem in front of you. Um, so, so bear with me for that. But I shall try to find um, the right poem. Let's see. So this is from Sally Purcell. I'm going to read from my book, but you can see it on the screen. Return of a dead lady. Sleepwalking back along the repetitious columned road over dark plains, uncannily empty of expected fiend or ambush. Lead me to those living strangers to whom you say I once belonged. Yet I have never known anything but quietly pacing this path in the chill, thin light after sunset. I have always been dead. A rainy moon has blurred my sight. No sound or memory can break my rest, private as a jewel beneath the mountain. Approaching night's boundary, Hermes must fail me and I go on alone. Those who have called me, do they know I shall never leave them again? And if I unshare that one, I can hopefully find the next one. Um, I'm sure you'll all know what that particular poem brought to mind. Um, and then especially in light of all the protests that have been happening since last week. Um, so it really resonated with me to read tonight. So I'm hoping that I've shared the right thing this second time. Let's see. Um, so I thought after that, we should talk about love. Um, and, and hopefully this will lift us a little. I love you like a small tidal river. I love you like a small tidal river giving itself to sea when the strong tide turns. Indivisible, the soaking sand below the water's boundary, each the other's fullness, mingled frankincense and phoenix ash, shingle clatters down the slope, obeying one endless undertow, the brute magnet of the moon. Lie gently in your natural harbour, my bones the breakwater, your heart the moon's reflection. Tears divide light into colours, emeralds through the fine rain, where scattered bones of snow lay long ago, ripe and broken fruit rests in the tall grass. So that was some Sally Purcell, um, who's a Bromsgrove poet. So I was doing my other duty, which is also to, to always uh, bang the drum for Midlands poets. So that was that. Um, and I thought, um, going back to um, the, the whole theme of um, community and collaboration, um, I thought I'd give this poem another outing. Um, let me see if I can uh, share the screen so you can see it. Oh, where is it gone? Files, oh. I'm actually struggling now. Oh, it's because I've minimized it. See, this is the thing with um, getting used to how the quirks of the technology. If you minimize something that you have open, it is not going to let you share it, Norsh. So I shall try to remember that. <laughs> um, but this is uh, Quinton, which is a collaborative poem that I wrote with my dear friend, Sana Afshan, who runs Poetry Birmingham with me. Um, we've not been able to work together properly in um, quite a while because unfortunately she's been quite unwell and so I was thinking of her and speaking to her and, and catching up today and I thought this would be a good one to read because um, it's the poem that we worked on together. So Quinton, and this is from the Quartets. In hell, he saw people's heads being crushed and returned to their original state to be crushed again immediately the night journey. One, 
God likes to repeat himself, the soliloquist rehearsing his lines, adjusting his inflection. Again, from the top, I'm thrust into freefall until I land bloodied on a jagged gray ledge, gaze downward and again you fling me. We would repeat this for eternity, never learning I would savor the rush of breathless pain, sanguine as I congeal, then ripped raw once more. Consumed, I am consuming hot, spicy broth and flesh that falls from bone. Its steam rises and clings to every fabric. When I wake in the morning, I breathe yesterday on the upholstery and drapes. On my scarlet bedsheets, your spectre sits watching me. I knead my daily bread with one hand in a glass bowl, soft, warm and unsalted, without yeast or fat. I slap it onto the flat pan, puff it in naked flame, break pieces to close around sautéed strings of onion and okra, feed you with three fingers you've kissed. On a brisk day at the beginning of spring, we walked through the botanical gardens, read labels to one another beside new leaves. You blew breath into my neck and cheeks. I kicked gravel from east side to small heath, Pause at this lay-by in the rain. Sit here in this dark again. Two. I have seen a girl invoke the wrath of the palmists. I have seen her fate unravel, ring finger to thumb, and I have seen that child lose Eden to the shadows. Two summers ago, she saw time writhe, tripped in the doorway of a dream to find a ropey creature slicing away that immaterial stuff bound to the whole. Now when she whistles her prayers for the crows, the song God calls back quakes the walls. I have seen a child lose Eden somewhere in, that, in this crimson and long fetid sheet. She marked spring's last turn there among wood bones and beyond her eye, look, a fox cub's murder his corpse lies in the lilac-headed clover, bathed in the bile of magnolia's tongues, and I have seen a child lose Eden. So what use has she for the fire language of poetry? Instead, give her a name for this choleric infection, for I trust all that comes within the innards ken, liver, gallbladder, spleen, lung, as was done. But what use has she for these stews of lamb's kidney, shank and chickpea, rice peppered with cardamom, if the fuel for her pyre has already been found, the tinder already struck? struck. Three. I fry boiled mustard greens and spiced onions and spoon them onto corn flatbread. All is wilted and crumbles, even that which waters my mouth and nourishes me. You gave me melancholy a transference from your sliced wrists to my clawed belly. I whittled myself hollow from the inside to suck every drop of black bile directly from your spleen. You were the harvest feast I swallowed as maple leaves turned red to carpet cold ground. Your virus lay latent in my blood for a decade while grief rebuilt my body with scars and sores, turned my scalp flaky, my hair brittle and blanched. I dreamt of scalding my face, woke to find a lurid purple welt leaking, night visions of how you've disfigured me, how I've grown torpid and deathly in these bouts of autumnal shedding. Fallen hair clogs my vacuum, this dust my dead skin held in columns of light cast across the room by the late day sun. At a flyover in Quinton, I park up and through tears stream into the lowest layers of hell. I'm compelled to recreate my tor torment like a god who repeats herself. Four. In the city, all snow. In the city, all snow melt water, all melt water symptom. And I've forgotten the smack of my so glazed cod lamb ajar, lussy, soy stained eggs. We've no more time to sit and ferment for the culture we bred, spread to the mind. It hangs like a smoking bulb from the ceiling. In the city, all snow, melt water, all melt water a symptom. And my murder of crows chews through bone, all those places phlegm tends to flock, 
When I turn over in bed, beg, they stop. They ask, why does no bread dot the yard? Would you toast a loaf of lung in the sun? In the city, all snow, melt water, all melt water, a symptom, and God finds me in winter's longest dream with his one hourglass eye, a crow tongue cry, holds a speckled bruised blue shell to my lip. When I suck out the mutating mandarin yolk, my half crow girl sigh singes the skin of sleep. In the city, all snow, melt water, all melt water, a symptom of sin. Right, I have to give apologies there for Sana because if she sees this on YouTube, she will tell me off because that was um, a proof copy that had a few little things out off kilter, but I remembered her words. So I, I think I read it all correctly. <laughs> um, and hopefully she'll forgive me for that. Um, I thought I'd read uh, a little bit from my pamphlet, which is this box set. It's been a while since I've read for it actually. Um, but this was published last year um, by Broken Sleep Books with their lovely um, bespoke um, pamphlet, handmade pamphlet imprint, Legitimate Snack. So this is what it looks like. And it's a little micro pamphlet thing, very small. Um, so I'm going to try to find the right uh, thing on my screen. Hopefully I've got it all set up actually on my screen. So I just need to find it in my book because I do prefer reading it from from this rather than on the screen but I'll I'll share um share it here I've got to remember that thing that I said last time which is if something is minimized I cannot share it so let me just maximize these on my screen again so I can see them um so I'll read from heredity first I don't want to take up too much time so this is um a longer poem um, which is why it, it, it's made this little micro pamphlet and it's a three section poem and I thought I'd read um, the third and final section rather than reading it all. Um, just so not to take up too much time because I read all of Quinton. So this is from Heredity and this is part three. They never said I couldn't befriend boys, but I knew the forbidden instinctively, like a sharp taste lifted off the ridge of my teeth by the tip of my tongue. So I played with them every day and never named them friends. We lived for playtime games, for cricket and football, British Bulldog and Tig, elastics and ring games, hunting four leaf clovers, school magazines, Bloody Mary, saber toothed tiger burning bright, hubba bubba inflating, fragrant and blush pink in rising July heat. We sped round Drayton Manor's Mississippi showboat to clamber through moving floorboards and spinning barrels, collapsing on the path outside, breathless with boys who weren't our friends. A melted tip top, sugared pear drop green. Surface tension held us, refracted and adrift in the uplift above sloping terracotta tiles between Grace Road and White Road, the silent mystique of Janat House, the question it begged of which Pakistani, which Indian, which Bengali families would put their elders in a home away from home, the dark greased car yard junk, lorries leaving the looming metal powder factory, beyond it the unlit car park where Asian teenagers could make out safe and seen, still worlds away, a bubble broken, broken every five years so that Sparkbrook kept receding and friends who were still neighbors became familiar strangers I was too shy to speak with at some affairs or when I passed them or when I passed by them walking along Anderton Road it receded or I was plucked out and driven by the red morning minibus traversing its pickup route to take a dozen girls away from Golden Hillock winding through leafy Mosley our old streets of Moor Green and into Selly Park where we were sequestered, blissfully segregated from the degradation of the streets where our brothers stood, where they rooted in and rebranched out, a sickly, darkening, dusky green. From high walls and van journeys, the concrete of bare backyards, crisp packet and newsprint littered double parked roads, the rationed hours of school day social lives, I kept the girls out. 
I rolled them in the green grass of Birmingham's botanics, slid them down thick mud in Holder's wood. They crushed blackberry juice between fingers and their eyes stung in, in smoke of open earth school fires for caramelizing apples. They would not be boxed in by brown fence or terrace house, by small plastic chairs or desks, whiteboards, stiff collars and bells, by given rules and rhythms, the lowering rock wall ceilings. We'll pour white wine vinegar over baking soda and cork painted bottles with, with elliptical fins. They'll foam the sky with white, they'll streak the sky in red. At Highbury Park, my daughter climbed over and fallen ash trunk with a boy she met. They fingered mushrooms, peeled back dead bark, found pill bugs. She told me she wanted to hold his hand and then told me when she hid under a table and they kissed. I watched them push their weight against gravity, be launched up together by our trampoline, its springs and her hair mapping the wave until she collapses breathless with the boy that she's befriended, a sun-dappled butterfly green. So that was the last section of heredity. Um, and my idea of, oh, I prefer to read it from the actual pamphlet rather than screen isn't a very good one because then you're worried about whether you've um, scrolled down on the screen or whether you've started reading past it. So, <laughs> so, so I'm not gonna do that now, um, but I will share the last, um, the last um, screen for you now and finish with um, this poem called Holding the Book, which is from the, the other um, micro pamphlet. Holding the Book, men, their narratives and histories, the myths that make them heroes or lovers. I've disgorged my witness, liquid ejector flung out of the jagged fissure you made. Oh, you are weaker than a woman's tears the traitor who turned me so treacherous. I laboured over you like a mother, threshed you by flailing with my own two hands, winnowed in wind and sieved between fingers. I gathered every grain a gold nugget, and when I opened my stores a year thence, I found you chaff and use you now as mulch. We ground, you bolted, I tarried leavening. You are nothing but air in my dough now incorporeal and rising in heat, needed for naught, bread sporing sudden mould. We shared tables, flaking morsels of meat, our lips came out in sores, cracked and reddened, we ate everything hot and heartily. An open ulcer maims the signet's wing, this grey down will not whiten to feather. Is mercy in killing or trying to mend? My calloused palms and wrinkled fingertips have worn themselves in wringing sodden hems. Oh, for the towered life of still waiting, the impatience of freshly found desire. Isn't it as exquisite, this slow death, this addle egg, this aborted fetus, putrefies in my sight, clings, to my in, clings in my nose. The promise you made is thin as ether, flammable as scritter, but unholy. I'm an apostate your word was not sacred. And that's all from me. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you so much, Nosh, that was fantastic. Our next reader then is Kate Carruthers Thomas. And um, Kate is the organizer of the Exchange Festival. Um, and so has been very busy indeed recently, I believe. Um, her first, first solo collection, Navigation, was published by Cinnamon Press, um, and she's also published poems in the anthologies Trio and Mayday and Other Poems, uh, which were also published by Cinnamon Press. She's currently working on an illustrated pamphlet provisionally entitled Year of Plenty. She uses poetry in her academic research on gender, and her research poem Glass is published in the Sociological Fiction Zine edition number five. She's also a poet in residence at academic conferences where she creates and reads new work on a variety of topics. That sounds fascinating, Kate, we must talk about that. And um, she, writes, she also writes about her poetry on her website, which is thinktreeways.weebly.com. So I'm very happy now to be able to hand you over to Kate. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Serena. And um, thank you to all the poets that have gone before me. Um, it's really lovely to be in the presence of, uh, of so many wonderful words and also to, uh, of course, the poet who will come after me as well. Um, okay, so the first couple of poems I'm gonna read are from my solo collection, um, Navigation, which um, was published by Cinnamon Press. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Jan Fortune, Dr. Jan Fortune, who runs Cinnamon Press um, as, a, as, a, as a labor of love, really, and, and who mentored me in the development of, of the collection over several years. The poems I've chosen for tonight have, have several themes and inflections, um, bearing in mind the International Women's Day context of this event. Um, the first poem addresses the experience of women um, in this case, women I met on a residential writing course who were talking over the washing up of how it felt for them to be removed uh, from their day to day lives and and of having the freedom to focus on on themselves. So this is residential. She was given a room at the top of the house, but the room seemed unready for guests, sucked clean of detail. Naked walls, a narrow bed, a table, chair, cupboard, an empty shelf. Each just itself, and in between the purity of space where things might have been. This was not what she knew. She understood the textured maze of home, layered chaos, history held in bulk, chronologies of passing passions shelved and cupboarded. She knew seeping drawers in bedside tables, breeding grounds for books and blister packs of pills and broken spectacles, still useful. Boxes children wouldn't take away, left luggage for a journey not yet planned, deferred. At home, she fitted neatly into spaces others left, crammed barely held ambition into disregarded corners. She stared at the empty space, not knowing how to fill it. Who for? What with? She knew they'd never picture her waking here, unnerved, unshaped, but breathing. And the, um, the second poem, um, also from the collection, um, addresses my early encounters with my, my, mother, my mother's dementia. Um, and it's one of many I've written about our relationship and probably one of many more to come. Well, probably. Um, but it concerns the role that memory plays in our lives. And she lives in Gloucestershire where they have Cotswold stone and dry stone walls and people make walls, um, you know, without any concrete. So this, this uh, poem is called Harting. They're repairing the wall on the lane where you live. The years have worn the face of it, but the heart remains true. They weigh each stone, hands gloved in yellow dust. Match make angles, planes, pick, choose. At their feet, butter crumbs heap and scatter. Stones once intact that slipped, shattered. Inside your house, memories, not mine, but borrowed from you, are slipping too. Stories shapeshift, fragment, childish certainties float untethered. We'll patch up the gaps. The heart of things remains. And I'm now going to read uh, three as yet um, unpublished poems from the pamphlet I'm working on, which is provisionally entitled Year of Plenty. Um, it's not about the past year of COVID. It's actually about the year before that, uh, when my mother became critically ill, spent four very long months in hospital and eventually moved extremely resentfully into a care home. And the poems in these in, in this small collection are, are from my own perspective, from the perspective of a daughter and a primary carer coming to terms with losing a role. These three poems are roughly chronological, 
in terms of the experiences they address. And I'll read them continuously without commenting in between. The first one is entitled The Longest Day. Early on, we both admire the sunlight as it daubs the hills. Can't beat this view, I say, you've got the best bed on the ward. But dusk seeps in, obscures the valley, and you too. You start to shake, mouthing questions no one answers. Opposite you, a woman snores, another keens. Oh, Lordy, oh my dear, oh dear. Darkness deepens. Your instinct, though, is not to acquiesce, but find higher ground, better air. You choose risk, the ambulance, the mask. You choose to travel through the darkness into artificial light, where staff in blue-green scrubs, sustained by haribos, grapple with machines. You're taken to a ward where others plump your pillow, log your heart, ask your name. Someone brings a chair for me and tea. The short night shifts. The year turns. I kiss your head before I leave. Hum. This year, my despair at winter trees, bare branches turns to admiration. As strip black, stripped back skeletal forms throw shapes into cold dawns and bleeding dusks. As weeks pass, I witness their displays, the complex promise of a single twig, the lace and fret of growth. I sense, inaudible beneath the traffic's growl, the hum. And in your room, your small world now, chords of life play on, the purr and click of oxygen, conversations with your friends, a child's cry, a barking dog, happy birthday badly sung. Beneath all this, the hum. Pool. I take my grief to water, to shed its heavy skin, to find relief in repetition, blue ablution. But grief, muscular and sodden, swims with me stroke for stroke, will not be drowned. Grief is the caught breath, the shock of surfacing, the knifing breeze at the turn. Instead, I am displaced, fractal dazzled, twined in the serpentine web of the pool floor. I take my grief to water and it sings. The final two poems I'm going to read are again from the collection um, Navigation. And I've chosen the first poem because it's about commuting, um, which was once a significant part of my working life. I commuted from Sheffield to Birmingham for five years, and now I haven't been on a train for a, sing for a whole year. Um, but I used to cycle to Sheffield Station and catch the train. And this poem is about that bike ride. Two wheels early. Puncturing stillness with speed in a city behind closed doors, below a backlit September sky, clouds unwilling to commit. Inhaling spiced air from Eid kitchens on Glen and Glover. Past door deals, first in finishing, new and reusable steels on Saxon, low slung beside the turquoise high rise of the mosque. Swerving potholes and ro roadworks as yet unrelated. Luxuriate on Shoreham's silken stretch, freewheeling, exhaling, wide curve on clough, nippy at the lights, black cab grumbling at my back wheel. Catch the stink and the molten glow of the tool press through open doors. Agile, navigating cabbies deep in conversation, the man who rocks, beseeching at the station door. Guilt, sweat, lock leave.
And I'd like to um, dedicate my final poem to my mum, Joyce, who remains in her care home. Um, we haven't seen each other in person for, for nearly a year now, although we have a weekly Zoom call, which she's adapted to quite well. She tells me that this poem, Turquoise, is um, her favourite poem of mine. I'm not sure that's actually true, but um, it's lucky because it is about her. It was inspired by the time I attended an old friend's funeral with her quite a few years ago now. And the poem is a tribute to her determination, character and resilience, all of which she demonstrates on a daily basis. So this one's for you, Mum. Turquoise. For the second funeral in as many weeks, she wore, wore turquoise. The old navy boys looked askance. She didn't mean disrespect. She was tired of attending so many endings, waiting with silver-haired friends as death came at them, a stopping train. Turquoise was her defence. I'm still here. A jewel in the gloom. A kingfisher flashing low in shadow. When they said the Lord's Prayer, she bowed her head emphasised the glory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And our final reader this evening is Ruth Stacey. And her second full collection of poetry was I, Ursula, which was published by V Press in 2020. And her debut full collection, Queen Jewel Mistress, was published by Eyewear in 2015. The pamphlet Foxboy was published by Dancing Girl Press in 2014 and her wonderfully titled poetry memoir How to Wear Grunge was published in 2018 and shortlisted for best pamphlet at the 2019 Saboteur Awards. Writing with Katie Ware and Morris, Ruth created a poetry sequence titled Inheritance, which won the 2018 Saboteur Award for best collaborative work. Um, her, I'm sorry, I'm checking I'm not muted, no. Um, <laughs> Her most recent pamphlet, uh, Viola the Virgin Queen, was published in 2020 and a collaboration with Desdemona McCannon. Um, it examines Elizabeth I through the lens of Twelfth Night by Shakespeare. Ruth is a lecturer at the University of Worcester, where she teaches poetry, memoir and the short story. And she also teaches and leads workshops. And you can find out more about Ruth on the Woo Writers page. So I am very happy to be able to hand you over now to Ruth Stacey. Thank you very much Serena, thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here after we had to cancel last year's event because of what happened with um, the pandemic and I was so looking forward to that event so to have it now a year later is, is a wonderful thing and it's lovely to see so many of my friends in the room tonight and also lots of new people to meet and I've had such a nice time listening to everyone's poems so far it's been just an absolute treat so thank you very much to everyone that's read so far. Um, I've actually I, I put my um, poems onto my website um, in case people wanted to look at them while the, the reading was going on to help um, if, if that helped. Um, so that's I'll put the link in the chat box um, if you would like to see that. Um, and then what the last poem I've got here. I, I should have done it with a shared screen, but I'm really sick of sharing my screen in lectures and all of that. So I thought I'd just put them on my website earlier today and that would be um, the way to do it. So yeah, so I'm going to read from a, 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 all of, um, almost all of the books you mentioned actually, Serena, but just a, a one or two from each one and then a couple of things from new collections that are being made at the moment. Um, so the first poem I'd like to read is from Viola the Virgin Queen. And this was a collaboration with an illustrator at my university called Desdemona. And it's um, quite um, a strange collection, I suppose, in some ways, because it's a collection of fragments and the idea behind it was to um, look at Elizabeth I um, through a sort of imagining her in the roles of Olivia and Viola in Twelfth Night. Um, Olivia because she had to rule um, the household after her brother died and Viola because um, she has to dress as a man, disguise herself to survive in Illyria. And so I sort of imagine that um, Elizabeth has to do these things as well. She has to take on a male role, she has to take over the role which her brother should have had, um, or the brother that her mother should have given birth to. 
and she has to sort of masquerade and guide, disguise herself in this role. Um, so yeah, so I created these um, small fragments and then Desdemona illustrated them so beautifully. And I really like working in collaboration with people. And I'm gonna read from a couple of collaborative pieces tonight. So, so the first one, they're not titled. Viola's father's house is white and red. Her pious sister, sickly brother, dead. Father, not impossible to untie. He had a mole upon his brow. She is all the children of his line. House, corridors, empty, only screens. Monument, seat, grief, waiting. Skin made of cloth, mate, reveal. To be a son, one, you must not, damask, elaborate, figures, coat filled with forearms, blazon, embolden, lists, costly cloth, masked, covered, disguise is wickedness, waxen, frail. Do not embrace me until I am Viola, when I have cast this male garb to the floor. And as I will never do that, then embrace me. You prefer boys, never whisper, never bees, never maiden, weeds, wildflowers, wilt, blazon, son, brother, twin, sister, died, sit, monument, monstrous, venom, fountains, Garments, costume, clothes, dammit, cloth, cheek. I am all the brothers, monstrous, regiment, bees. Now, a, a lot of my work, I, I tend to voice um, historical figures or um, I look into the archive. I love collecting fragments and placing things together. And I like to work with ambiguities and layers of voices and I like to find voices that have been maligned or forgotten or, or revoice them. And, and, you know, the majority of my work is female voices. Um, so it, it is interesting to me because I don't particularly think of myself, first and foremost, as a feminist writer. Um, but I, I do have this interest in um, sort of reviving voices and looking at the past. And those poems came together with tiny fragments from Elizabeth's own letters and from John Knox's um, sermon about the monstrous regiment of women. Um, and I do get angry quite often. I think some, some of my poems can be quite sort of impa impassioned and um, wanting to sort of set things um, straight and let women speak. Um, as Jacqueline said at the beginning this week, you know, that this week's have been some triggering things in the news about um, everything. And I could have chosen some quite you know, quite angry and dark poems, but I've tried to pick some other ones tonight, but they are very female centered. Um, the next poem uh, is revoicing someone from the past and it's, it's Jane Morris, um, Jane Burden as was. And um, I wanted to, uh, in, in I Ursula, I, I wrote about a lot of muses. So artists, muses, and you know, they're objectified and they're silenced and they're decorative. And so some of them were artists themselves, you know, Jane was an incredible embroidery artist and, um, you know, I wanted them to have the chance to speak back at being placed in this role of being a muse. So this is Jane's and this one comes from the form The Golden Shovel and it uses William Morris's um, uh, motto down the side, have nothing in your houses that you do not know to be um, useful or believe to be beautiful. And I thought how that place you as a woman are you useful or and are you beautiful are you beautiful and if you're neither are you any use at all so i've got jane answering that motto so this is jane's poem decorative there are colorless times when i consider what i have strip back the illuminated walls and there is nothing but plaster and dust an illusion of decoration to dwell in three players a king, a queen, an errant knight. Your design is a triangle. Arthurian acted badly in these houses. Before I realized, I stepped into a mimed role, one that I could never change or alter, a part in a mask you wanted to play out. 
inevitable adultery. I decided to do what I felt best. I am no legendary queen and will not perform the script. What can I illustrate that you don't know already about sorrow and longing? It is rose petals used to make jam. The pale pink jelly is nothing like I want it to be. Impossible to capture the smell or beauty. It is only useful food rather than the ambrosia I imagined. Portrait or photograph. In one, I am a goddess. In the other, I believe I am myself, mournful, thoughtful, entirely Jane. I want to transform myself into another life, one free of you, Will. Be far away from legends, imaginings, and never, ever beautiful. So I'm, I'm going to read two poems from um, a collection I wrote with Katie Ware and Morris. And in it, we discuss um, motherhood, but from two perspectives. So my voice in the collection is a woman living in 1887, and Katie um, voices a contemporary woman. And the sort of conceit of the collection is that Katie has um, voiced character has just had a baby. She's up late at night feeding it. And she, she sort of digs out this box of old documents, letters and things that has been passed down the family and she's always meant to do something with them. And as she reads these um, old diary entries and things, she sort of connects with this woman in, a pa in the pa past and sort of has this um, sort of, it, it kind of empowers her in her mothering. So this is just after my, my character has had her new baby and she's previously lost two children in the past. And it's called Knowledge. Each woman in the village has called to give a gift, some embroidery, a pie. Each man has smacked his back, shared a drink. The tiny female child sleeps in her box by the doorway. Sunlight warms her cheek. My feet drift. A swallow could not swoop as I swoop, so nimble now. Many to watch her, many to help. Mindlessly, I walk to the pool, linger to watch the rabbits jump. I am fixed on their lazy pleasure. Turning, sodden, I head for home. There is nothing unknown. A herb for this, a prayer for that. Women come to the cottage. If I shouted, my voice would carry and someone would come, a woman would come. And the second poem is called The Certainty. Describe it to me, you say, tell. What, how I would pull rushes until my palms oozed crimson to build a raft if that was what she needed. That I would sleep with a man for money if my baby was starving that I would sell my long hair to a richer, vainer lady. But I know I would fight death next time he comes to collect. I would take my body and shield my baby from his scythe. Truth fills my mind with the color blue. Mothering is a brutal kind of work. Bodies merged together with blood. Is that what you want me to tell? Do not fret, love. Doubtless times will never be that grim. Okay, so I'm just going to read two poems at the end that are from new works. Um, one is from a new collection I've written with a photographer in America whose name is Krista Kay. And I met Krista from my last collection, which was called How to Wear Grunge, um, which was a memoir and was sort of written um, about um, some rock stars, muses again, whose names were Demry Paro and Pamela Corson, um, Jim Morrison and Lane Stader's girlfriends. And I kind of wrap the, their biographies in amongst, I sort of meld them together in lots of fragments as usual and lots of ambiguities. Um, and because of that, I met Krista, who's actually Demry Paro's friend. And we became really good friends and we started communicating all via email in long letters. And um, we've never spoken actually, I've never heard her voice. And um, she would send her photos to me and we would talk and, and all of these things became these letters. And this collection means a lot to me because it helped me through a dark time last autumn when I was very, very poorly with depression, to be honest. And female friends, you know, well, male friends as well. Um, I love all my friends, but um, female friends can be really very important. And Krista became that to me. So this is a poem from the collection. It's called The Dark Room because it's, it's all about photography and nostalgia and things and old photographs and it's, yeah, so hyper nostalgia. Krista, 
I have borrowed this title from you. Cardboard holds the souls of those no longer breathing. Old shoe boxes or something more substantial brought for the purpose, decorated with a William Morris pattern. Lids fit clumsily after many openings, although that lessened over the years. The chemical smell buried in the layers. Now there is dust and this unexpected return, wanting to go back and dwell there. Pen pal is a comforting word from childhood. Paper letters with stamps waiting in the post box. We mail our art back and forth to each other. This summer, that is what you have been to me, a shoulder to lean on from across an ocean, exposed without any negatives. And just the last one um, was the other link I put in the, um, in, the, in the chat box. And I wanted to read this one because it's from my new collection that I've been um, sort of agonizing over for three years with my PhD. So just because it's, it's finished now, the collection, I just, I just wanted to read one for you. So it's about um, an artist called Pamela Coleman Smith and the whole collection is an imagined memoir of her life. And this poem is about the actress Maud Adams, who I imagine that Pamela um, is in love with, but it's unrequited and she's watching her on a, in the theater, playing the role of Peter Pan dressed as a man. So it's called Watching Maud Adams. Pan, stars are banished to be observers only. All they can do is wink and nobody can decipher what they mean. It is a punishment, so I'm told. Maud, Maud, then untethered. Rope turns in the water like a yellow snake. Wooden boat catches the flurries. Forlorn lady lies supine. The knight may mourn her, yet he does not notice that she longs for his battle-strong arms. The knight is a woman. Joan of Arc leads a white horse. It looks so sad. Her calves are shapely in the green tights. Gripping the balcony, leaning forward to see more. Joy as the leap across the stage takes flight, feather in the cap flutters, skip, hop and elbows raised and flute pressed against the lips. I took armfuls of painted scenery for you to view, but you were not there. I left my card, never grow old. Wide sleeves decorated with leaves, I want endless curtain calls so I can cast flowers at your feet. White hot flames drop from the sky like rain. More. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thank you to all of our readers. Um, I, I couldn't have asked for a more inspiring and indeed emotional evening. I feel like I've been on a bit of a journey um from you know mu we've had muses and mothers and collaboration we've had love children and food and a great deal more um and i realize that we are running rather late but um i'd like us if, if for those of you who can stay around i'd love it if we could continue the conversation a little bit and think about women's poetry today because um i think there is so much more to be said and um so if our speakers are happy to um, to do this, I wondered if they could turn on their microphones and perhaps we could think a little bit about this. I wanted to, um, my desk is now covered in post-it notes um, relating to things that you have all read and things I want to look up and think about more and so on. Um, but um, as a kind of way of starting us off thinking about this, um, I was reading, um, as one does, some um, Elaine Sissou earlier and thinking, um, and I'm not going to make this all theoretical, but um, and uh, because she says that to be that for a work to be signed with a woman's name doesn't necessarily make a piece of writing feminine. Now, what do we mean by feminine? And is there such a thing as women's writing? Now, uh, I'm guessing from what Jacqueline said er earlier about um, resisting rightly, in my view, I think, the feminist view that women shouldn't use masculine forms and language, um, then what is women's writing? What is women's poetry? And also, if we can't, we can't think outside the language that we have, because we don't, in my view, have the possibility of doing that. So what, what else is there? What is women's poetry? Feel free to join in in the chat, by the way, if anybody would like to do that. I'm waiting for someone else to answer that yeah. question. <laughs> I, th I think it's really interesting. And I cer cer certainly feel 
that I don't want to be called a, a, a sort of um, a women's writer in that I sort of, as if, because I feel it sounds so um, containing, you know, like I, as if I only have certain subjects that I cover. And I, I am aware that, you know, I am writing about motherhood or, you know, I am, I'm voicing other women. So I, there is a kind of um, a womanly kind of aspect to my practice but I also write you know really you know other things that are completely different to that so I, I don't know I always bristle a little at the thought of, uh, of being contained but I do wonder sometimes you know all my collections have pictures of women on the front and I wonder do do men read my collections you know it, it is a it is a sort of question mark of whether it puts people other people off my work I don't know it's so centered on female writing uh, female experiences, I don't know. Well, it could be worse. You could be called a poetess, like um, oh, yes. <laughs> the 19th century writers, so, which is a, true. a label I very much resist for the writers that I write about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think certainly what, what is absent in the canon of poetry is stuff around the domestic, things to do with women's bodies from the point of view of women, things to do with periods, things to do with, you know, with childbirth, with motherhood, with all the things that we associate with, with women, you know, with the gender of being a woman. Um, and so I think we have a great deal of catching up to do. And I, I think there's plenty more space for it. And I, I'm very much reminded of what, when I um, pitched an idea to, to someone at the BBC and it went uh, for, a, for a film it went quite a long way this is we're probably talking like 25 years ago now um, and it was based on a relationship a friendship between two women and in the end he said I'm really sorry um, you know we met up we had the discussion and we decided that because um, two years ago we did have another drama about a, a friendship between two women we can't make another one now um, and I think there is this sense that you know that Perhaps that there is it's finite this material, this material that that we might associate with women, you know. And the point is, it isn't, you know. Men have been writing about war for for millennia, you know. But women have not had a lot of chance to write about childbirth for that long. So I think I think there is no such thing as women's writing. We we can write about anything we want to, but it just happens that we have these underexplored experiences that I think is really great to bring out into the light. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good way to describe it, underexplored experiences. Yeah, as, as part of the um, festival yesterday, I ran uh, the BCU Menopause Cafe. Well, there's an underexplored experience. <laughs> I mean, not, not by menopausal women, obviously, but, you know, generally, in the, and, and probably in poetry. I don't know if I've, I have written a poem about menopause, but I haven't, um, I don't think I've read any others. But there's a so, there's an anthology called Bloody Amazing, um, and uh, it's oh. full of poems about periods. And, and there are quite a lot of poems about menopause in that in that anthology. Oh, so I must read that. Really, really good. Yeah. Okay. So maybe oh, I'm 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 really resistant to to uh, containing it as well, um, partly because. Um, there are lots of ways of you know stereotypical femininity I don't fit into or subscribe to or whatever so um, I don't sit down to write a poem thinking I'm a woman writing a poem I just think I'm me and I'm writing a poem so but 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 then again we have to set that against the canon which is generally pale male and stale and um, you know in, in all in all disciplines actually you know not just poetry it's something I fight against all the time in my field which is social sciences so yeah I, I have no answers <laughs> I have no answer really yeah I, yeah I totally agree with with what um Kate and Ruth have said about not wanting to be sort of pigeonholed as a woman writer because we're just women who write I, I find it interesting how um I suppose this links to to what Jacqueline said about um, the topics that, you know, possibly women write about more than men. And, and kind of in my um, editing role, I read a, a very good poem recently that someone had submitted, um, a man had submitted about, um, and he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm writing about something, something new here. And it was um, sort of a poem about um, a kind of a woman who, a kind of dark poem about womanhood. And, and it was a very good poem. 
but I read it and I thought, well, I don't think you are writing about something new because women write these kinds of poems all the time. It's just that perhaps you haven't read them or aren't aware of them because of because you're a man writing it, you sort of think it might be something new and unexplored, but actually there are lots of poems out there like this. They just happen to generally be written by women, perhaps. So women, I mean, uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, no, no, go you on. go on, you go on. Let's, <laughs> you, you continue, please, Serena, do. Sorry, I'm, I'm actually just reading Helen's comment. Um, it's appealing because of the themes of female experience, which I, as a woman, am interested in. Bodies, motherhood, emotion, relationships, um, friendships, mothers, children, love, desire. And these aren't inferior or stereotypical themes to me, but more interesting. Above those, of perhaps cooler, more cerebral male experience, really. Perhaps this is because I've been helping homeschool my daughter all week with her poems in GCSE Conflicts and War and the Armitage, Hughes, Shelley, etc. are considered more important or serious because of the topic, but are less interesting to me than what I've heard tonight. Thank you, Helen. That's <laughs> a lovely comment and really helpful as well, I think. So, yeah. Is it, so, are we saying then that women's poetry is not a helpful label because it is exclusive in a way or excluding perhaps men's interests? Uh, we whereas, don't, we don't have men's poetry, do we? Well, this is, and this is my point, but I mean, if any, if any of you have read um, a book called Invisible Women, then we don't need to say men's anything because men's is the default. No. Um, and so to define women's poetry as something different makes it therefore lesser, I think, um, without wishing to make everything about the 19th century, which obviously I often do, um, in um, Aurora Lee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And if you haven't read it, you totally should, because it's absolutely amazing. Um, and a, a book length poem is always worth reading. Um, she says they judge a book not as mere work, but as mere women's work. And I think that's really telling, isn't it? Um, so, so yeah, so I think the label of women's poetry isn't particularly helpful, but at the same time, what we're saying is women's poetry is actually about women's experience women's bodies, women's lives, um, which in many ways are at very least biologically, but also um, socially, culturally, and so on, um, very different often from men. Yeah, it's just that those things are not considered universals, which war or, you know, um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, there's some fantastic poems by, by, by men, um, including the the men in this group um you know i'm not i'm not trying to decry that at all but it's it's about that sense of what's considered the universal and what's considered kind of marginal really and these things are not marginal they're the experiences of of over half of the population i mean that's a that's an absolute cliche but it's you know it's true uh so it's how they're perceived how these things are perceived i think i think and just, even even though sorry you haven't spoken, I'm, I'll be quiet, Nosh, go on. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I thought maybe just to defend the term a little bit, um, it's useful to think about when I seek out women's poetry specifically perhaps, or when um, I think about women's poetry. And I was thinking a little bit about representation and uh, the fact that for me personally as a reader, um, you know, when I was younger or even now, I wasn't particularly seeking someone like me when I'm, you know, when I was reading a piece of literature or where I'm, when I'm, you know, um, you know, reading a poem, that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a poem um, and for what a poem does to you as a reader when you're reading. And in that context, it didn't, it doesn't really or hasn't really mattered to me who's written that poem or that perspective that, you know, that it's come from if I can somehow relate to the specificity of what's happening in that poem, um, then it has done something universal that I can relate to as a human. So there's some human experience. So that's, that's fine. It wasn't necessarily in that context as a reader that I would seek women's poetry then. Um, and I think perhaps I sought it more as a writer. And it was as a writer that I thought, well, I'm interested to see what women are doing um, and and what you know what tradition I'm writing into or who has come before me and and how they've tackled these topics that are perhaps specific to my experience as a woman and can I relate to them um, and and sort of being curious about that and wanting to seek it out. 
So, you know, that's perhaps what I'd be thinking if I was to go and Google a women's anthology. I would be looking to sort of make some kind of emotional connection to a literary heritage then as a woman um, and to sort of seek female experience in that. And again, it, it is for me, I, I would think then about it is women um, bodily experience and, you know, um, you know, things like uh, growing up as a girl and what that's like and how you discover, um, you know, the, the cultural sort of limitations that are put on you as a girl, whichever culture you're born into. Um, and then, you know, the bodily experiences that you encounter, whether it's starting menstruation or, you know, um, pregnancy or childbirth or whatever it might be. So those very specifically female experiences, I suppose are things that I look for. So in that sense, I think it's useful as a term when you're seeking those things out um, and looking for them and trying to find a starting point of where to look to, to see that reflected. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think because, um, you know, when, when this collection is put together, like um, Bloody Amazing that Jacqueline mentioned, or Carolyn Jess Cook's anthology about motherhood and experiences, or the Me Too anthology that Deb Alma made, and you know, is collecting um, as as Nush said these these sort of experiences together, and that is useful to be able to find you know that you know these are the voices I'm seeking out and I want to hear that haven't been heard before. So I think that these these anthologies that are created are. are you know, they're under the heading of women's writing, I suppose, or, or wit, po female poetry. So it's good that, you know, that they're, people are making those efforts to collect them together. Mm. And as Savannah points out in the chat, uh, ex female experiences differ very hugely. So there are some going to be some shared experiences, but it's also a, a very broad spectrum, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I work a lot in sort of experimental forms and I, I think that, you know, it's, I find them kind of liberating because I know Jacqueline was talking about, you know, traditionally male forms and, and years ago I started a press um, which is called B Press and, you know, the very first thing published was this really kind of, um, you know, satirical kind of angry feminist collection that was parodying sonnet and different you know traditionally male forms and subverting them um, into female um, focused forms and they were quite bawdy and erotic and was having a lot of fun with it um, but what I found sort of as I've continued working is I, I really enjoy working in experimental um, forms particularly you know at the moment it's a prose poem which is allowing a lot of like a lot of space, a lot of voices to be layered and a lot of ambiguity over who is speaking and what voice is being heard. And I, and I think I'm enjoying that a lot at the moment because you can combine this kind of new voice, which I think is quite exciting. So um, in the chat, um, Gina says, does the term woman liberate or constrict? And for some, it can be both. I, I think that's right. I think it's um, my view is that it's very difficult to uh, kind of separate the fact that in some ways it's a kind of umbrella term. But in other ways, it is it is quite constricting, I think. I don't know. I mean, women can do anything, right? Absolutely. So just because you're a woman or think anything or write about anything. Um, so I don't think it has to be constricting, but I think that, 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 you know, you're just entering into this world of poetry and putting yourself into your poems and w whatever experience you've had is, is going to affect what it is that you're writing, you know, whatever, whatever um, your identity is as a woman. And for, as you know, as we've said, for, for women, it's many, many different, there are many different things. There are women who are mothers, there are women who are not, there are women who've never had a period, there are women who've had periods, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, but it's just making space. I, you know, more and more think that, that, what, that, that there are fashions, there are, there are movements that come and go that seem to say that some things are all right and some things are not all right, you know, and some things we can carry on going on about for, for centuries and others we have to accept that we've explored them now and we're moving on. 
Um, I think Kate Clanchy's newborn was a good example of that, is that everyone said, okay, well, someone's done a collection about having a new baby now, so we don't need any more of those, you know. It's that type of thing. We just need to address the balance. We just need to redress the balance. So there's enough of everything going on in our cultural life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of uh, speaking about it, this idea of redressing the balance and having enough. And I, I was thinking back um, whilst listening, at, and I was thinking about the contradiction in some of what I said myself, that as a reader, I was quite content reading, um, you know, what was the branded, the pale, stale and male sort of canon. Um, but then, of course, that wasn't entirely true because then I did seek um, that female experience. And then there's this pressure to, or not this pressure, but there's this idea, as um, Jacqueline said, of this has been represented, but nothing's ever, the human experience is never represented mm. enough. It's multitudes. And so all these different ways and experiences of being a woman, um, you know, we want to see that in the art and the culture around us. And so there's never enough of it. So even though it can seem, perhaps it can be limiting in some ways, um, you know, the more we sort of subvert that by writing into it further, perhaps that will, you know, go some length in sort of getting rid of those limitations because there's so much more of that material and so many different ways of reflecting the female experience. Mm. Which is not static anyway, right? Because, the, you know, society changes and things change, although you know, as the last past couple of weeks have really taught us, some things don't change. And I think, you know, we need to keep addressing those issues. And honestly, the male writers are not going to do that for us. You know, I, I, I don't believe that they are, or maybe they will, but so far they haven't. Um, you know, I'd like to see men writing about those things more. Mm -hmm. So then we don't have to take it all on ourselves. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? But, um, that's me throwing down the gauntlet a 